My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Garrett Kramer is the founder of Inner Sports. He has provided mental conditioning, performance consulting, workshops, and crisis management to Olympic athletes, NHL players and teams, professional golfers, collegiate athletes, and well-known business leaders. He is credited with bringing the inside-out paradigm to the athletic community at large. Garrett's work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, and Forbes Magazine, and he has appeared on ESPN, Fox, NPR, WFAN The Fan, and The Golf Channel. He is the author of two books, Still Power and The Path of No Resistance. Please welcome Garrett Kramer. All right, Garrett, so where are you from? I was born in Patterson, New Jersey. I grew up in Clifton, New Jersey. Gotcha, gotcha. I was into playing hockey. Pretty much yeah. that's what I was into. <laughs> the Rockets, right? Yeah. Uh, they've always was, had an unbelievable program. Yeah, I was a probably a squirter of Pee Wee right at the conception of the Rockets. The Rockets were originally the Estes County All-Stars, and they played out of South Mountain Arena in West okay. Orange, which is now Cody Arena, and Branch Park in Newark. And then the Senior Rockets, which were a semi-pro team, they took the name of the senior Rockets. They were a semi-pro team gotcha. that played out of South Mountain. And then the all-star teams became the Rockets. That's how the Rockets started. Okay. Years ago. You're talking 45 years ago. Okay, so then you started playing for the Rockets, and then you started to get scouted by some colleges. Is that right? Yeah, I played college hockey at Hamilton College. Had Did you game. play right out of the Rockets? Yeah. No juniors or anything? No. Well, we played, played Junior B. So okay. Junior B, was there was no Junior A in United States back then. It was Junior B. And my senior year in high school, I played Junior B for the Rockets, and we won a national championship. My line mate was Brian Mullen, who played for Winnipeg Jets, Wisconsin, and then Winnipeg Jets, and then the Rangers and Islanders. So Brian played on that team. Another one of my line mates was a guy named Kevin Foster, who was an All-American at Vermont, and we beat Wyzena, Minnesota in the finals. We actually beat Chicago Young Americans in the semifinals. Tony Granada was on that team, actually. Okay. So in college, you had a couple knee injuries, right? I had the first knee injury of my senior year in high school. I actually played that junior national championship with torn ligaments in my left knee. I had surgery two days after the tournament was over. So yeah. that was April of, my, April of my senior year in high school. That was my left knee. And then two years later, pretty much the same injury happened on New Year's Day at Colgate University. We were playing Colgate, and the same thing happened to my right knee. And what year was that? 82. Okay. And so were you done playing college after that, or you kept going? I kept going like enough. <laughs> I kept going. So what did you do after college? What did you get into? I actually coached the JV team at Hamilton for a year after college. I was always into coaching. At My mm-hmm. dad ran a skating rink in New Jersey, and I would coach clinics and stuff at, at the rink. I really wanted to coach. Coaching was always my first love, and I wanted to coach. So I did it for a year. But then I realized I had to start making some money, so I bounced around for a few things. I, I worked on Wall Street for a year, couldn't stand it. Yeah. I then worked in the residential construction field for eight years or so and did pretty well in that field eventually, but also didn't love it. And then I've been doing what I'm doing now, which we'll get into ever since. So, yeah, so I was reading your book, The Path of No Resistance, Resistance, and you were coaching hockey, and you kind of like just slipped into this little bit of depression, and you didn't really know what was going on, and what was going on in your life at that point, and how did you come out of it, and how did it place you on the path you're on right now? Well, I'd say that what we're describing as depression was building from the time I was young till I was about 25, 26 years old. I was a constant coping machine. I was lucky enough to stay away from illicit stuff like drugs, and I didn't yeah. I never did drugs, and I never even drank much, really. Mm-hmm. But I would cope through hard work. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So I would cope through totally killing my body or hitting people on the ice, you know, getting yeah. into fisticuffs or banging around. And 
I would cope through running excessive amount of, you know, track work and lifting and mm. just a constant quest to fix my insecurity. And then when I was in my mid twenties, this really hit a tipping point where it was just constant. Yeah. So what I did was I did what many people would do, which we hear about all the time is I made appointments with therapists. Mm-hmm. psychologist, psychiatrist. I tried yoga, meditation. I upped my exercise and my running even more. Tried at that time medication. And incredibly, I was getting even worse. So I said, okay, well, this therapist isn't the right therapist. I'll go to a different therapist, thinking that would be the answer. Or this mm-hmm. medication wasn't the right medication. I'll try another one. Or this uh, meditation routine isn't the right one. Let's try a different one. Yeah. So it was a constant quest to cope, to fix my insecurity and my anxiousness and my paranoia, whatever. And I was absolutely stepping on the gas pedal with my tires and mud. Yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable how bad it was getting. Now, at this point in my life, I had what I would describe as just my first insight into what was going to change my life and the path of my life. That insight presented itself. And again, I'm going back many years now, 27 years now, but the insight in my memory is, all right, look, dude, this isn't working. Like this constant quest for the cause of your feelings and all these therapists were pointing me back to my past and some tragedies and difficulties in my past. So this constant quest for the cause of why you feel so bad and the constant quest to cure why you feel so bad, that isn't working. Yes. So you got two choices. Kill yourself Mm -hmm. because that'll fix your feelings. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Or if that's not going to be it, why don't you do nothing? Because everything you're doing is taking you, as I said before, further into the mud. Yeah. Now I have to say, it looks to me like the reason I chose B was because I was engaged at the time to my, now my wife since forever. Yeah. And I was with it enough to not want to hurt her. Mm -hmm. So killing myself was not an option. Not that I really cared because I didn't care about living. I just cared about not hurting her, which at least I was conscious enough to look at it that way, which is actually in hindsight how bad I was. Yeah. There's a lot of truth to that, by the way, which we can come back to. But anyway, so here's what happened. I literally cold turkeyed any coping strategy. I cold turkeyed going to see therapists and having them point me back to my past Mm -hmm. I cold turkey, any coping, anything, zero. Mm -hmm. Not that I stopped exercise necessarily, but I stopped any coping for the quest of feeling, any strategy for the quest in order to feel better. I just totally said it was obvious to me that this was where I was going. So I just cold turkeyed trying to feel better. Yeah. And amazingly, what happened was I started to feel better. I would say three weeks into feeling better, I had – the second insight that changed my life, that changed and the course of my life. And that mm-hmm. was that, oh my goodness, the human mind is built to fix itself. Yeah, definitely. I knew the body. I had been taught that the body, if you leave it alone, and you know that better than anybody, yeah. is designed to fix itself. But nobody, nobody but nobody had even, I had never heard, I had never even read, I had never even noticed that the mind is built to self-correct. So another way to say that would be human beings own a physical immune system, but we also own a psychological immune system, and nobody knows it. And still, yeah. still nobody knows it. So in an instant when I saw that, as someone who loved sport, was good at sport, somewhat respected in sport, at least locally at that time, mm-hmm. and also – love coaching, yeah. what occurred to me was I got to bring this to the world of sport because sports psychologists are so much about fixing and giving mental strategy and techniques and things to do in order to elevate your state of mind and thus your performance that they're just totally jamming players up because you cannot deliberately do that, nor it's not necessary, right. A, and B, you, it's impossible to do it. So Absolutely. I took this understanding to the world of sport quite boldly using contacts I had and I just went for it and 27 years later I'm still here. 
So when you said you were contacting people, what did you do to get the word out? Because obviously this is a fresh thought. It's a new idea. People probably don't know what you're talking about. How did you get your message across there? Well, what started to happen was I was coaching at the time, and luckily I happened to be coaching some of the New Jersey Devils players' kids. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're alumni. It was former players' kids. Yeah. And these guys, because of the impact this understanding was having on their children and on all the children, they started to notice and wonder, like, what does this young guy I'm in my 20s now, you know, I'm like 27. Yeah. Old. What does this young guy know? Like, there's something about his coaching style, the approach, right. the direction of pointing these players that's different. And mm -hmm. they started to talk to me about it. And that's how it made its way into pro hockey. So I bypassed all the minor leagues. I went, wow. I went right yeah. to the top. It was crazy, right? And then what happened right around that time, it was a little later, but that happened. But the big breakthrough in hockey was getting a phone call from J.P. Parise, Zach Parise's yeah. father, out of the blue, saying, my kid was just drafted by the Devils. I want you to work with him. You didn't have any conversations with J.P. before this? The only kind of, I learned this in hindsight, I had written some stuff. I had not written a book yet, but he, I put some articles out there. And J.P., who was the director of hockey at Chattuck St. Mary's in Minnesota, mm -hmm. The factory that's produced Zach and Jonathan Taze and Derek Stepan and Sidney Crosby, on and on, yeah. and Drew Stafford, who now plays on the Devils. JP had kind of noticed something in my work. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And JP actually, we became quite close. JP was the op antithesis of this. JP was what I was. He was an ultimate yeah. grind. Temper sometimes got the best of him. He was a heck of a player and scored some really big goals in his career. In a weird kind of way, he wanted better for his son, which yeah. we all do for our kids, which is fine. Yeah. And he reached out to me and said, look, I'd like you to work with him. And Zach at the time is 18 years. He, he, he played uh, two years at North Dakota, but he was a young, young. Mm -hmm. So Zach embraced the work in a big way, wrote the forward to still power my first book. And because of Zach's excellence as a player, nothing mm -hmm. to do with me. He's yeah. just a, one of the best American players of all time, obviously, captain of the U.S. Olympic team, et cetera. It made its way throughout. It continues to because Zach has a lot of young American players in the league. Yeah. who look up to him. You watch the game between the Coyotes and Rangers tonight, you're mm -hmm. going to see a bunch of those guys from the Minnesota area, the Shattuck area. Yeah. A bunch of these guys are kind of like understudies of Zach, and I work with a bunch of them as a result of that. So where do you start with a young kid that's got the world in front of him? He's obviously got a lot to learn. Where do you start with a young kid like that, that's just a stud, he's got everything going for him? What do you look at? What are you looking for? What is he looking to get out of it? Well, it doesn't matter if it's a young kid or if it's a 65-year-old person or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's always the same thing. What we're talking about is a universal understanding of what the human experience is, which I'll get into in a second. So it doesn't matter what age a person is. It doesn't matter what they, their life experience is. That's the old paradigm. In other words, we're going to look at your life history, what you've been through, your biology, your intellect, all that stuff, and we're going to then make a plan for you personally. Well, that's what I've been fighting all these years. Because yeah. anytime you go to the personal, you're going outside, so to speak. So what we're looking at is what do human beings have in common? What's universal? Because truth is always found in what's universal. It's never found in a person. So that said, what I will commonly do with a person when I first work with that person or a group mm -hmm. is ask a question, something along the lines of multiple choice question. What causes a human being to have a feeling? Now it might sound kind of cheesy, but just go mm -hmm. with me. You'll, you'll understand mm -hmm. this. So what causes a human being to have a feeling? Here's a multiple choice question. And I'm not going to put you through it. I'm just going to give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the first answer would be what causes a human being to have a feeling? The answer would be a circumstance the past, a situation, mm -hmm. another person's behavior, traffic, how much money you have, something like that, a circumstance. Right. Right. B would be thought, our thinking. C would be both. So to review, the question is, what causes human beings to have a feeling? The answers are a circumstance, thought, or both. Now, mm -hmm. people who are listening to this podcast, I can promise you what I'm going to say is true right now. 
99.9% of people who are listening right now are thinking the answer is C. I can promise you, I've been doing this for a lot of years. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's honest. So yeah, and the fact that people say C explains every problem in the history of human beings. Now I'm saying that with complete surety, even though mm -hmm. people will question what I just said. Like that can't be true. But here's the thing: every human being, at his or her core, knows that feelings are an inner game. They are 100% connected to thought. Another way to look at thought is it's just energy that comes and goes. When energy builds up inside of us, we feel crappy, insecure. When energy or thought starts to flow through us, we mm -hmm. feel fantastic. Right. Our feelings ebb and flow as a result of energy coming and going, thought coming and going. End of story, full stop. The outside, circumstance, has 0% to do with that. Zero. Not even 1%, let alone 50%, which was both, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that human beings create their reality from in to out. We are not capable of working from out to in. So I completely again, agree with that, yeah. Another way to say that would be our state of mind, our thinking, how that energy is flowing or not, will create our experience. Our experience cannot create our state of mind and the confusion between the knowing that it's an inner thing but the illusion that the outside is doing it that is why people answer c and that is incredibly confusing to human beings my job is to remind them of how it works okay not to do anything with it in other words i don't tell people what to do how to act none of that it simply remind them where their feelings are really coming from that we're living in this illusion that it looks like traffic, how much money we have, our past, the weather, the president. It looks like all that stuff is what's causing our feelings. That is never true, even though it will look like it's true. What's always true is our state of mind in the moment, which we don't control, will create our experience, will project outward and create our experience. So it's an in-to-out Absolutely. Game. And again, that's all that I reminded those players I mentioned before. I don't do anything else but remind people of that essential truth. Now, does that take some time for them to click? Yeah. It varies. Like, for example, when we talked about this briefly and even now, it kind of jives in you. Like, you see it. You see yeah. it. I don't know how extent you see it, but there's no right or wrong time frame. I mean, it's all over the map. I could give a, a lecture. And let's say there's a thousand people in the audience and I don't know, maybe just two of the thousand will understand. <laughs> right. But yeah. maybe a hundred, maybe five hundred, maybe the them all it's it's all over the place. What I tell audiences very often is I can probably guess at what the ratio of understanding is gonna be in this group by the time we're done. One third of you is gonna think I'm absolutely out of my mind mm -hmm. to suggest what I just suggested to you before. Right. One third of you is gonna kinda of say, you know, that's kind of cool, but I don't really know what to do with that information. Yeah. And one third of you is going to say that explains everything. Mm -hmm. Now, the funny thing about it is if I came to give the talk on a different day, where you would sit would be different. Right. In other words, right. It's not that one person is dumber than the other or less conscious than the other. It's simply where that energy, where that level of consciousness is at that moment in time. Yeah whether it lines up or not. So it's not anyone's fault if they don't see it. Right. right. It's simply, is it time for you to see it? Mm -hmm. My question, so when you have all of these things in the world coming from the outside in, like pressure from your job, money, all these feelings coming from outside in, because it's very easy to get caught up in that. How do you remind yourself to go inside out? Well, first of all, you don't have any feelings coming from outside in. So what you're saying, it's important. I'm not busting your right. chops here. It's important yeah. to phrase the question relatively cleanly and that when the illusion, this is illusion, what saying, yeah. when yeah. the illusion is hitting you that your feelings are the result of X, Y, and Z. Another way to say that would be when you get the order mixed up because it's very easy to think that the circumstance ha happens first yeah. and that causes a feeling. But thought and feelings happen so quickly that we don't catch the order. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is your feeling state in the moment will always determine your perception 
or your projection. It was actually a better way to say it. It's never the opposite, even though it will look like it's the opposite virtually yeah. all the time. Now, there's nothing you can do to switch that. So it's more about understanding what's happening, not doing anything about it. It's not a right. matter of you've got to fix it because the fact is, this will sound strange, but the illusion is normal. If you're a human being, you are going to do that. Mm -hmm. It's actually what's so great about being a human being. I mean, we both love hockey or sport. If you didn't do that, when you scored a goal, you wouldn't even <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't get happy. Yeah. But you're buying into the illusion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's fine. I watched my own kids play sport and during their careers, and I'm all into that. It's fun. Yeah. It's part yeah. of it. And it's also equally as fun to kind of like, oh, darn, like it's all part of it. Right. It's just really important to know that even though we're doing that, that's really not what's happening. And if you reflect on it, you'll see that a hockey player, for example, has scored goals before. And sometimes he's like really psyched. And other times yeah. he's like, ah, oh, whatever, I just yeah. scored. But you've got to look at it closely. It's not really what you think. Then you've lost games or you've had something go bad in the office. And it's mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like, oh, this is the worst thing. And other times it's like, all right, I'm cool. I can handle anything. It's That's never true, the yeah. thing. It's like traffic. You sit in traffic sometimes and you're so frustrated. Yeah. Other times you sit in traffic and it's like, all right, I'll just chill. No big deal. Right? Mm -hmm. It's still the same traffic Yeah. because you're never feeling the traffic. Your feelings are already happening. And that will create our projection or our perception of the traffic. It's in to out, always. Yeah. Just think that it's crazy. Like, it sounds like this is, if people would grasp what we're saying, let alone performance, we're talking about you couldn't have a war. You could not have a war if people understood this. Yeah. It's possible, let alone divorce being rampant, let alone mm -hmm. bullying, let alone road rage, let yeah. alone abuse or terrorism. All these awful calamities, so to speak, are totally the byproduct of misunderstanding. If people mm -hmm. understand where their feelings are coming from, it's an inner thing. If you and I understand where our feelings are coming from, I may disagree with you, yeah. but you can't cause me to feel anything. So there's no reason why I got to fix you in an attempt right. to fix my feelings. It's illogical. And yeah. one of the areas that we've worked in, and you've, you read it in the book, is in bullying. The current paradigm in fixing bullying is to give the bullies and the victims and the bystanders things to do. Mm -hmm. That just jams the system more. The minute yeah. you tell people, that, remind people of that, hey, that guy cannot cause you to feel anything. Unless it's, you let it. Well, it's not even letting it. You either understand yeah. it or you don't. No one's trying to miss it. So yeah. it's really understanding, right? So let's say a bully, let's say a 12-year-old is a bully. Once that bully wakes up to the fact that he works inside out, not outside in, he'll never bully again. It will be illogical when he feels insecure to try to beat up somebody else in a quest to feel better. That's the only reason people bully. Yeah. That's it. There's no other reason yeah. someone bullies. And we've had incredible success in schools in pointing young children in this direction. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how fast bullying cleans itself up without us even telling people what to do. It's just simply, yeah. hey, reminding them what we're talking about today. This is what I woke up to so many years ago. Like, and my whole life course of my life changed. And by the way, I don't want to say like, I get this, I don't get up in my head at times because I absolutely, absolutely yeah. yeah. But it's helpful to know why I get up in my head. I get up in my head because energy comes and goes within me, nothing to do with the outside. And when that happens, it's almost like, okay, I'm up in my head right now, but I'm still okay. Like, yeah. bring it on. I, I can still perform. I can still love my wife. I can still be a good parent. I can still work. There's nothing to fix. So you just kind of let the storm pass and just you're aware well, of it? I let the storm pass. In a perfect world, you would see that if the storm is normal, if the human mind is and the human experience is built to ebb and flow, and the ebb and the flow are both normal, which they are, then the storm is normal. The storm is part of it. The storm is the ultimate blessing. When you start to see that the storm is as much a blessing as the calm, you could care less. You stop really noticing your state of mind so much. I have players say to me, you know, hey, Garrett, tell me something. Is this normal? Because last night before the game, I was a complete insecure wreck. But for some reason, I didn't give a crap. Like, I was fine okay. with that. Yeah. Now we know we're getting somewhere because that player knows that coping is never the answer. Never, ever, ever. Never, ever, ever ever. There's never anything that has to be fixed, ever. And when you start to wake up to that, 
you realize that you can excel, you can serve, you can care, you can love, no matter what your state of mind is. Okay, right yeah. now, the world is under this cloud, this constant quest to fix their state of mind because we're almost programmed to believe that you've got to be in this optimal mindset in order to excel, in order to be a good person. That's just simply not true. The human mind, like any energy frequency, is meant to – this is the waves of energy. How they come. That's how we're built. We come and we go. And really, that's what I'm about, pointing people in that direction. So how did you get started with writing books and everything? Did you bring someone on to help you voice that message, or you just kind of like wrote the book and then had someone edit it, or well, how does that luckily, work? Luckily, just for me, I've always been a decent writer. It's like if I went to Hamilton College, which is like the second best writing school in the country. Now, by the way, the funniest thing is all I wanted to do was play hockey. I didn't even know that when I was there. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that. I think like they're number one or two or three. If you checked it out, you would see that. But somehow it kind of did seep into me a little bit. Like I learned how to structure. And I write every week for my email list. So I have a very large email list of athletes and general managers and pro sports and regular people. And it goes out to that audience every Tuesday. And those articles ultimately determine the sections of the chapters of my book. So if you look behind me, which is just funny, yeah. you see that messy board back there? Board, yeah. That actually is the beginning of my next book. So okay. what that is, is all the articles over the last three years grouped together in chapters. So I have seven chapters and which, where they would. Uh, okay. And what I do is I take these articles and I obviously edit them big time. And I kind of meander the story together. It's Got kind it. of arduous, but that's how I do it. And that's the actual start of a book with the working title of The Myth of Mindset. That's the title of the next book as of right that's now. The next book. Yeah. So, Garrett, where can people find you or seek out your books or your help? Do you have a website or anything like that? Yeah, just my name, just my name dot com, GarrettKramer dot com. So, you've written two books so far. Yep. Do you recommend reading one prior than the other? Or? No, no. I would actually recommend reading The Path of No Resistance. The other book is called Still Power. That was the first book, but I would read the second book. That's closer to where this work is at now. Gotcha. You can check them both out. They're on my yeah. site somewhere, and you could anyone could check them out and take their pick. But I encourage anybody who reads the books or checks out the work to keep in touch with me because it's very easy to – what we're suggesting, as you can see today, Kev, is just a total 180-degree paradigm shift in how we help people psychologically. Yeah. I mean, and in your business and your field, it's so similar. It's – Nuts. Yeah. I mean, especially mm -hmm. your particular specialty, which I know mm -hmm. very well. So it's a whole different ball game. It's the same thing with what we're talking about. And I could tell you that it's just like in any paradigm shift, it's met with a lot of opposition. In other words, yeah. But ultimately, when the tide shifts, it's never going back. It's such as the earth being round. I mean, it sounds right. crazy, but yeah. not that long ago, you're talking people would have laughed at you if you suggested that the earth was not flat. Like yeah. people would have thought you were a lunatic. And this yeah. is true. Like, yeah. right? so, like it sounds ridiculous. But yeah. even in my lifetime, I was born in 1962. In my lifetime, in 1968, when the Apollo astronauts landed on the moon, they took pictures back of the somewhat round earth, right? Mm -hmm. Life magazine wouldn't even publish them at first because they were afraid that people would freak out when they saw what the earth really looked like because the flat earth paradigm was still not completely out of the psyche of human beings. That's, that's in my lifetime. Yeah. That's it's true. Crazy. And just like today, well, the psychology would say, it's nuts what you say. You're actually saying that if someone is struggling, don't fix it. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. The mind is built to fix itself, and it will do that to the degree you don't try to fix it, right? Right. That is blasphemy to therapists generally, yeah. right? So you must get a lot of resistance from sports psychologists and all that, right? Absolutely. Now, now how does that work, too? Because you're working with these professional athletes, and a lot of teams have these sports psychologists in place with their organizations. Do they jump out at you? Or? Oh, of course. But the thing is, I'm not saying that just because you look in a direction I've suggested that you're going to excel and you're going to win major golf tournaments or Stanley Cups, but we've done okay. So the okay, truth right, is, yeah. putting, like, and I'm not even saying I necessarily care about that. All I care about is that paradigm shifting. 
Like, ultimately, yeah. that's why I'm in this work. I know that there's unnecessary struggle out there. I know that human beings are doing crazy-ass things in a quest to feel better. So if you look at people who are hurting other people,